This is the Ben Shear Golf Podcast, where we will be talking science, fitness, and everything golf performance. Welcome to the Ben Shear Golf Podcast. Super excited for my guest today, a uh, friend for a long time, super smart guy who I think uh, will have some insight that a lot of people will be interested in. Today, my guest is Brian Bradley. He's the vice president at the Agoscu Method. He travels and lectures and teaches to medical people, trainers all around the world, as well as does some really awesome stuff traveling with the tour with Tony Robbins. So, Brian, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I, I know we have some East Coast, West Coast stuff going on here, so let's uh, let's just have some fun today. Yeah, let's keep it civilized for the East Coast, uh, West Coast wrapping wars. Exactly. So this is no, we, we don't have the fitness wars, so hopefully we'll be okay. Um, be. Yeah, perfect. So I want to do this. Why don't you tell the people a little bit about yourself, number one, and then number two, talk a little bit about what exactly the Agoscu method is. Yeah, that's very simple. A lot of people may not even know what we're saying when we say the Egoscu method. Um, they're not going to be tested on spelling or you know pronunciation. So let me start with that real quick. The Egoscu method is based on a gentleman named Pete Egoscu and what he did coming out of Vietnam back in 1971. He was basically told after injuries sustained in the Vietnam War that your hip and your knee and your back and all this stuff you're dealing with chronically – is an issue that you have to deal with because we think it's now emotional psychological. Well, it was psychological at that moment when he flipped the guy's desk over and said, that's not going to happen to an angry Marine. So he picked <laughs> up Gray's anatomy and went along. And you know Gray's anatomy. It's not the easiest way probably to learn, especially to a guy that has zero medical training as you know what we're surrounded with now and what we went through. So he picked it up and just said, okay, I'm coming from a layman's standpoint. What's wrong with me when I know it's physical? And it turned into the hip bones connected to the knee bone connected to the ankle bone, like the song says. And I can't put it any more simplistic than that. But when you think about the emotion that goes with it, that's what really caught me. So I hooked up with them back in 1991. I was out of university for a year and a half working for Health South, working for JFK Medical Center in Florida, trying to build my career. OK, and then realizing what I didn't know. And as a guy, you don't handle that really well. You just go like this, yeah, I, I don't know that, but I'm not going to let anybody else know that I don't know that. But once I ran into him, it's like everything became okay because of the emotional tie to his story. And then what he put me through and what he taught me after about 90 days was a game changer because I never looked at the human body the same way again. So when somebody says, hey, my posture is off, well, now that it's out there in the mainstream, because 20 some years ago, we made a, a pact to say we're going to shift the paradigm as it relates to treating cause versus symptom. Now everybody should be looking at it, at least in the mirror going, is my shoulder lower than the other? Is my head forward like this? And we all know that's there because of this kind of stuff. Egoscue focuses strictly on get the hip back to balance, specifically get the psoas speaking to the rest of the body so that the femur head, the leg bone can rotate correctly, the pelvis can rotate, the upper back can rotate, the neck and head can rotate, and we're specifically talking about golf now. And that's what really intrigued me way back when. And it was funny because I had to finally call my dad when he was still alive back in the early 90s and say, uh, hey, uh, I just gave Jack Nicholas a golf lesson. And he <laughs> said, well, there goes golf, because I wasn't the golfer in the family. I played my whole life because we had to, but my brother was the lover of golf. And I looked at golf and, and training somebody like a Jack as let's train the athlete, which was his belief system. His whole belief system is put the golf club down, pick up a football, go for a run, get on a bike, then pick up the golf ball or the golf club. That was his whole belief system. Train like an athlete versus that one sport focus on a body like we see today that's succumbing to the technology. Yeah, I think obviously technology is kind of the death of posture. I mean, maybe that's an oversimplistic way of saying it, but I think for the, the listeners out there that technology is the death of posture, whether it be your cell phone, your computer, whatever the case may be, these things are forcing us to be in forward flexion and create kyphotic postures and do all kinds of stuff. And we don't have to dig into all the details of it at the moment, but I think those are big things. And we see those things then translating out to the golf, out to the golf course and we see, see postures and all the different, you know, problematic setup postures that we see from so many different players and you know posture is something in our world in the medical world the training world the fitness world whatever that there's a lot of 
I don't want to say debate or, yeah, I guess debate would be the fair way of saying it, about, you know, there are the people who, like the Agoscu people, who really have a very strong science and belief system built around that when things are stacked up properly, in alignment properly, that allows for good movement. And then there's another camp that basically will turn around and say, well, your static posture doesn't really matter. It's more about your ability to move in and out of postures. And that's really the magic to posture. You know, what are your thoughts on that? You know, do you think, I think obviously you do think that static posture has value. You know, why, why do you guys have the belief system you have? And what would you say to someone who tried to make that other argument? Yeah, look, my Skype name is the posture guy, so I better believe it, right? So it's a, uh, it's one of these things where I look at it and say, they are right in the sense that your body needs to be able to move in and out of posture, and it is very important. Just the golf swing alone, anterior, posterior tilt mixed with lateral flexion and rotation of the hip. The pelvis has to be able to handle that movement in all planes of motion. Basically, to the listener who doesn't really understand what I just said, and that's okay, because I didn't either for a while, but you have to look at it and say, does your pelvis transition through the golf swing the way that it should? Not if you've been sitting all day, not if you've been driving a car that's an automatic where your left leg does nothing and you've been commuting three hours a day and you expect to load your left hip the way you load your right in your golf swing, it's not going to happen. So when somebody says, Brian, does posture really matter? I flat out tell you it's number one. It is the foundation for all movement. If you can think about a circle and just put posture, don't even put a goscue in the middle, just put posture, static posture right here. Yeah. If we can correct, if I give you, Ben, a hockey player or a golfer or a baseball player who kind of looks like this, shoulder down, head forward, and the pelvis is here and the feet are turned out, or I give you somebody who's perfectly aligned, which athlete do you know right away, instinctively, you, which one do you want to recruit for your team? Yeah, I'll take the guy who's pretty much a good lineman. Yeah, I think people can start thinking about it. It's like if you think about the hip socket, the acetabulum, like a bowl, and then we have the head of the femur sitting in there, that if our static posture, it's jammed forward, or that thing's sitting on the lip of the bowl, let's just say that, yep. or whatever we want to call it, that's sitting in our bowl is jammed against the lip, and then we say, okay, turn and rotate, that's not going to move nearly as well, or flex or extend or whatever, as if it's kind of floating inside the inside of the ball and there's room for it to move all the way around inside the ball it's not pushing on the edges of the ball at all and creating that friction and tension which even sometimes people might be able to move but then what is the damage they're causing to those tissues etc well this is exactly what you're talking about which is the fastest 40-yard dash ever run in the nfl combine we won't mention any names you could google but it. that that's the guy you're <laughs> exactly you can google it um but that's a $19 million contract that we were sitting in the war room at the 49ers and we're talking to these guys and they're like, we want them, we want them. And it's like, don't touch them. I would not touch this guy. Not his fault either. Strength coaches love them. But if they, if they don't have the mindset to look outside the box and at least do some type of functional movement screen, and at least do something from foundation. I don't care where they get their posture stuff. At least do something from TPI. At least do something from on base. All these different things. And they're actually just looking at the person going, well, they're fine. Let's just apply the, the, the bilateral protocol that I give to everybody else. Here's something I heard the other day on Instagram. And I think Boyle was involved in this one with uh, uh, Twitter. Somebody was saying, the death of bilateral exercise. And I think what they're doing is they're, they're goading Boyle to get involved in this because what I love about him is he's not afraid to go, you know, it's one of those, right? Yeah, like I've been friends with Mike a long time. And for people who don't know who Mike is, he's a very famous strength coach. He lives up in Boston. He's kind of, you know, he did work with the Red Sox when they won the World Series. He's been, he's one of the pioneers in our field and kind of uh, really a hockey guy. I would call him a hockey guy more than anything else, but super, super smart guy. He's been doing it a long time and he's kind of had this whole idea well not idea but his big belief and he was kind of not the only guy but obviously the guy who's willing like you said to spend time on social media willing to get out there and fight the fight that you know doing unilateral training is more beneficial than bilateral and it gets into bilateral deficits etc um but kind of likes to get into the debate more often than most <laughs> would on social media but aren't they correct if they're a hundred percent correct when the differences are 
that apparent if somebody walked into you and say, there's a posture before and after. Train that guy bilaterally when he first came in with the rounded shoulders and the pelvis that was asymmetrical. Train that guy bilateral and you've proven their theory right. Sure, because now you're, you know, you're, you're going to load the guy in all kinds of bad compensatory patterns. Correct. That's why CrossFit, quote, hurts people versus saying the body you take to CrossFit is what hurts people. I, I'm telling you right now, if CrossFit's smart, they get a hold of me as their expert witness. I will shut every lawsuit down because <laughs> there's no way that CrossFit has hurt someone when the body going to it is so asymmetrical that whenever they add a bilateral load or whenever a person does bilateral work with another strength coach, we're feeding the narrative that bilateral is wrong and we have to go to unilateral. But if we go to unilateral, we haven't corrected the dysfunction that has had the asymmetry be the, the, the guide for their body up to that point. And eventually their talent is gonna write a check that their body can't cash. Yeah, sure, but I mean, look, maybe they should hire you to bring your Agostu method or whatever else you do to kind of be the uh, prerequisite to being a CrossFit athlete, right? Because I don't look at CrossFit as a workout. I'd look at them as athletes, the guys who are doing it on a serious level. It's a sport, right? I mean, it's not, you know, it's not going to the gym to get in shape. It's, it's actually a competition, right? So like any of our athletes, pro athletes that we work with or serious competitive, you know, even That's right. business people, doesn't matter who you are, but like there's a, there is a progression that we must go through. We don't just say, do these crazy things, jump off of these boxes, do the whatever until we know we have some functional capacity, for lack of a better way of describing it, of movement, of strength, of stability, all of these things before we're going to put them under certain type of loading parameters, right? That there's a prerequisite that needs to be created. And maybe where CrossFit would benefit with you is hire you to help create some regressions that they can use to actually allow these people then to properly progress. Yeah, I like to tell them, um, and I hopefully won't get in trouble from the uh, television series. What's that one called? Pardon the interruption. But PTI. that's really what it is, is pardon the interruption, guys. But you have to interrupt this movement pattern that you're putting them in, which is why you can test and test and test and test and test. But if you don't apply a stimulus, and it has to be simple. Remember who we're dealing with now. You mean I can't be instantly gratified? I can't I can't get instant gratification. I can't so Google that's it. The, <laughs> that's exactly right. That's the mindset that we're running into with the, the twenty-five year young and, and younger versus twenty-five and older might wait out a little bit, but you get you give me a fifty year old and above, I have a true athlete. Because they grew up climbing trees, running, jumping, climbing, hopping, biking, walking, versus my kids a one sport athlete now. Very good, but I little does he know since two years old, I've been training him as a multi sport athlete, even if he wasn't in multi sports for the past three years. Yeah, but like prior to that, was take him to the park and, and play with him. Yeah, and one of the things I tell a lot of parents who bring their young kids to our facility, and you know, they, they hear a little bit about long term athletic development or they hear about multi sport versus specialization. You know, I say, look, you can emphasize, but don't specialize. And I say, you don't have to sign up, write a check, and put on a uniform to be a multi sport athlete. Like you said, that's right. You can go to the park, you can go surfing, you could go ride a skateboard, you could go climb a tree, you can occasionally play some pickup basketball with your friends, you can go through, throw frisbees. There's so many things you can do that make you from a physiologic uh development perspective have the same positive response as you would being a multi-sport athlete without actually having to create structure and time commitments and financial commitments and and somewhat the nonsense that comes with actually youth sports getting away from that and just going out and having some fun uh well look you know i live in southern california and one of my biggest goals was the way my dad grew up in pittsburgh he was the only white guy basically in the uh the pittsburgh area um where he grew up and who had, you know, he had tryouts with the Steelers and Colts, which apparently his genetics did not flow to me. But it's a, he, there was no such thing as race in my family in the sense of race separation. And I took my kid to the park for that reason, for soci sociological, um, so he can understand that, you know, you're, everybody's, your, everybody's your peer. But check out this, this video that I took in Tenerife, Spain in August on my Instagram. This is 10.30 p.m. at night. Now, that's 10.30 p.m. Now, a couple of my crazy therapists are going to show up in here for a little bit. But if you can look at this and go, 
How many kids are at the park? Okay, forget about her. Forget about her. <laughs> Oops. But, but look what they're doing in the background. Way up here, I'll zoom in. There's a rock climbing thing to climb up the grass and then a slide to come down the grass. And when would you think about your society you live in right now where you're living? Would you ever see someone at the park at 10.30 p.m.? No, not unless they're trying to avoid being shot or something. <laughs> I mean, That's correct. It's like there's a drug deal gone bad. Exactly. Okay, so it's, it's a difference in society. And it's one of For those sure. things where you and I have training facilities, you know, and I have, what, 30 around the U.S. that all believe this mindset, get out and play. And you are giving your kids such an unfair advantage by doing what you're saying, Ben, which is, you don't have to be the superstar at baseball just to go out for amateur league baseball. If your kid's a baseball player and you put him in AYSO soccer versus U.S. Developmental Academy, I mean, there's two different sports here. This guy's not getting looked at for a D1 scholarship. This guy is. But it's allow him that multi-sport stuff. Like I played every sport known to man, but I was only good at a couple of them. I mean, I was actually really good at all of them. But I'm talking well, about... Well, you're talking about Brian Bradley, but no, I'm saying, but you're saying, okay, was I good in football? Yeah, I was decent in football. I didn't like to get hit. Okay, you can't play safety if you don't like to get hit. Sorry, it's not going to happen. And wide receiver and coach goes, hey, Bradley, run that five-yard drag across the middle. And I'm going, I'm so dead right now. That was no interest to me. So you don't have to be good. I, I love what you just said. Just try something else out. If they really want to not put their kid in a concussive sport, put them in rock climbing. In my opinion, every golfer should rock climb twice a week. It would make yours and my job way easier because now they have to wake up the opposite leg that they're not using. For sure. All right, let's do this. Let's grab a quick break here, and then when we come back, we're going to dig in a little bit more into kind of some of the stuff we talk about in golf as related to golf posture and setup posture and all the things that so many people in their lessons are talking about or we're seeing in magazines, on television, and people are often fighting. So when we come back, we're going to get into a little bit of that. We'll be right back with Brian Bradley. Do you want to take your body and game to the next level? Do you want to get a program from the best in the business the same way tour players do, but don't have access to the finances to do it? Finally, Ben Shear Golf is offering various online training options for players just like you. Now you too can have access to the best golf fitness has to offer online and at a price you can afford. For more information, go to our website, www.bensheargolf.com to learn more. That is www.bensheargolf.com. S-H-E-A-R to spell sheer. Hi, I'm Ben Shear, PGA Tour trainer, Golf Digest fitness advisor, and host of the Golfer's Edge on Sirius XM PGA Tour Radio. So when I first saw these sticks, I knew I had to get involved. Three huge benefits from this type of program. Number one, it's gonna allow us to get our club and our body in positions to have a consistent, efficient, and effective golf swing. Number two, it's gonna reduce our risk of injuries. And number three, the big thing everyone is looking for, it's gonna allow us to hit the ball that much further. As a listener to the Ben Shear Golf Podcast, you're eligible for a 10% discount on all stick and golf-related purchases from Stick Mobility. Just use the promo code BEN10. That is Ben with the number 10, all one word. Go to stickmobility.com to learn more. That is Ben, the number 10, all one word. Welcome back here with my guest, Brian Bradley, Vice President of Vigoscu, Super World Touring Lecturer with Tony Robbins. And we are talking posture and you know, not just posture, but talking posture for sure. And posture in the golf world, which is what this podcast is really about, uh, and fitness and health and body related to the golf swing is a huge thing. We talk about setup posture. We talk about maintaining posture. We talk about loss of posture. All of these things. Posture is a big term in the golf world, right? And no one knows about this stuff better than you. So... You know, we often talk about the things I just mentioned, right? But we're gonna, I want to kind of circle back to where we started this conversation, which was with static posture. How, yes, do you, sir. how do you see or what do you think what we see in our static posture? Is there a direct correlation and I'm, or causation, whatever you want, to some of those swing faults that we may be seeing going on that I discussed from just a basic static, static assessment? If you looked at someone's basic static posture, do you think that I can then make the leap of faith and say, okay, most likely, not a guarantee, but most likely I'm going to have these things going wrong in my golf postures. Yeah. Like what would you say? Because remember I, I deal with uh, 
uh, I'm going to say this just to get people riled up a little bit. I deal with athletes, not golfers. Yeah. And uh, if anybody ever tells you that the golf swing is not athletic, they're absolutely crazy. They've never played the game. Um, one of my favorite things was Tiger Woods going back with the violin and coming forward with like some rock and roll, you know, because that is the two different sides of the swing. Your body has to be in a very athletic position to do it. What would you say is the number one fault you see when you're working? Because I guarantee you your numbers in golf are probably higher than mine yeah. versus football and all this kind of stuff. But I see the same deficits. What would you say is the number one thing that you go? Or is it early extension? Is it casting? What do you see? Well, I think early extension is number one. And, I, I, you know, I think that there's a lot of reasons why that happens. Um, you know, I think for some people it can be physical. I also think that thrusting and lifting is a very powerful movement. And a lot of people are trying to hit the ball far. So they're using that kind of early extension or that moving of the hips towards the ball forward and up as a power set, you know, as a power source, trying to create more vertical forces, trying to increase club head speed. So I, I'm a, a little cautious of saying it's always due to limitation. But at the same time, lack of strength and speed to me is a limitation also. So what, what if it was, and deposit. remember, we're going back to static posture. What if it was this guy's pelvis coming to you, oh, which you can sure. see that he's, yeah, he's overdosed on no acetal. Right. And um, he's basically, he has, he's already in the early extension just on his normal posture because of the forward sway of his pelvis on the gravity line and the posterior tilt. So right. now he's going. My pro said, get my hips back, which then puts him in more kyphosis. And then he's up here with his arms doing this. And then he tries to say, well, I've got to rotate. And his form of rotation is thrust the hip forward into early extension. So one thing we would, one thing I would do is I would say, let's just take him to the, the opposite. Like, for example, look at his foot position. What could you do instantly on the range to affect his hip posterior tilt with his feet? What could we do? Yeah, just get him a little bit more squared up. <laughs> How about we just pigeon toe his feet 45 degrees, toes touching? Yeah, it's more squared up. Tighten up I mean, yeah, and just, Oh, just from an just, exercise perspective you're talking about. Yeah, just well, yeah, yeah. say I'm up at the, I'm at the golf ball and I'm here. trying to give a little warm-up exercise to get him kind of That's correct. in a better position. And while I'm just. showing him what I want him to do, here's what I want you to do in the swing. I want you to stand pigeon toed with your quads tight for one minute. And then this is what I want you to do. And he's like, oh, my God. Okay, now grip the golf club. And now we have a guy who doesn't early extend as much. So the static posture, in my opinion, is something we're very – like I look at somebody and I say, look, I don't even have to look at your golf swing, Mr. Nicholas. I'm not giving you a golf lesson on your swing. I'm looking at your inability to load your right hip that you're going to overload your left hip. So I, I have to guesstimate with what we see up from the static side. Yeah, so what's interesting is in today's world, um, so obviously we're saying we do believe that you can see things obviously in static posture that relate to it. Like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, if the joints aren't centrated or in the middle of the socket properly, using the hip example we gave earlier. So, if, you know, it's not in the middle of the bowl or the same thing you could be said about the shoulder joint or whatever, the ability to move freely is going to be limited, right? And then obviously any restriction in movement in golf because golf happens to be the one sport that basically demands the most extreme ranges of motion in the most segments of the body of any sport, at least I, yep. that I can think of. <laughs> remember, um, remember, be careful. You're calling it an athletic sport. Yeah, and then know. there's a lot of people who go, it's just golf. Right. And then you want to do it really fast with real good precision and all that stuff as well. I mean, yep. God forbid <laughs> we make it athletic. And, but if we just look at the best players in the world today, obviously they are some of the most athletic people you've ever met. Um, you know, but so the question is, one of the most popular teachers in today's kind of social media and just not even just social media, but media in general is, you know, I'm not going to use names, is basically teaching people to set up in a kyphotic posture, slightly kyphotic. And if people don't know this, it's like a little bit of a rounding of their upper back or in the golf world, we might call that a C posture, uh, however you want to do it. But kind of that the bad posture we we're talking about with your head slightly forward, your shoulders forward, your upper back slightly rounded and your pelvis tucked underneath or what we call posterior pelvic tilt, kind of like that gripping strategy where you're kind of like squeezing your butt underneath to kind of grip at your posture. And they're using this as a strategy to avoid early extension, which we, like we said, is the, the hips moving forward and up in the golf swing. What do you think about that as a strategy? A, from a efficiency I think perspective genius. and B, from a health perspective. Oh my God, I think it's genius. If the goal is this, remember, mm -hmm. I want them to stop the early extension Let's put him at the threshold of early extension. The guy can't go any further. 
there goes your early extension because you're already there. I think it's literally the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I mean, flat out, whoever does this is flat out brain dead. So let's because, talk. Yeah. Sorry. Because listen, once you take that, just, just go Stuart McGill, a line of thinking out of Canada. The more you bend over like this, he believes you only have so many bend overs to touch your toes before your back's going to wear out. Yeah, for so people who don't know he, Dr. McGill, he's the most famous kind of back doctor in the world. He's not a medical doctor. He's a research doctor who has done yep. probably more research on the spine and very involved in the golf world. Uh, Absolutely. And, and his belief system is keep doing it and you're going to prove me right. Listen, so I, I came, you know, I, I sit through his seminars and I listen to him and we're on some of the same speaking things wherever we're speaking. And I look at it and go, listen, I, I know what you're saying, Doc. It makes complete sense. Because what this person's done with the golf swing has given in to the dysfunctional postures that they're seeing. So I don't even blame them for teaching the posterior tilt and the kyphosis. Because what they're seeing is, I can't solve the problem. I'll meet the problem and just go with it. So what I guess then I would ask is, let's talk about, from your perspective, from a medical perspective, what is the health risks and dangers of now going into set presetting flexion, posterior pelvic tilt, blah, blah, blah. And then saying, okay, let's do explosive rapid rotation with coupled with side bend from that position. So when they're looking at the screen right now, my hands up like this, that's the natural S curve of the lower back. It should be in this natural close packed, put your two fists together and whoever's listening, put your knuckles together like we're doing and just keep them together and kind of move them around, but put some tightness in there. Nice and stable. So you're making two fists and you're putting your fists together and kind of lining up the joints between each other, the knuckles between each other. And, and kind of putting some around. pressure in there and that's your, that's your spine closed, packed and stable when the curve is there. The minute we take the pelvis and go posterior, we flatten out the lumbar curve, which loose packs the vertebrae. Creates so space, now, people. <laughs> that's correct. Picture a chain that's taut or a chain that's loose. And the chain that's loose is much more vulnerable when you start pulling both ends real fast, which is really what's going on. And let's say over time that metal isn't strong enough to withhold this and it starts to wear and tear. Whoever's teaching this, and listen, I'm not, when I said they're brain dead, I do apologize. I don't want to be so judgmental. You kind of, um, you kind of do. Only, they're, they're only <laughs> half brain dead. When I say this, because what they're doing is they're, they're feeding a narrative that makes sense to them. Right. Well, My job is to come in and say, here's an alternative Here's an alternative that really serves the customer and contributes to the customer and their compelling future versus what you're really doing is you're keeping me in business. Thank you, but you're keeping me in business. Yeah, another, and another part of their, their theory of this is that by pre-activating posterior tilt or act pre-activating the glutes, we'll call it for this conversation, right? When you, when you pull your pelvis underneath, you happen to turn your glutes on that they think that is actually more powerful by having them on pre versus having them actually fire, quote, I, what I would call in time. Um, they've taken away the natural ability for the body. Let's go back to what we talked about before. They've taken away the natural ability for the body to change postures through movement and adapt to the movement, which we talked about 20 minutes ago. There, it, that, those are two opposing fields right there. My job is to come into the middle and say, look, I need you over here on the left and you over here on the right, just a little political humor, um, <laughs> to actually come together and everybody, everybody will be much more symbiotic at that moment because now your body has to be able to go as one pelvis is rotating and possibly going anterior and the other pelvis is coming through and possibly going posterior. And for people to understand, anterior pelvic tilt is when you have more of an arch in your back, your low back. And posterior tilt is when you kind of tuck it under and flatten that. And by the way, both sides of your pelvis can move separate of each other. So it's not like once you do it, it's both sides. That's where the bilateral work is getting a bad idea because they're going, well, I tried to have them do some air squats and their left pelvis is winking more than it is on the right. It's posterior versus the other one. Yeah, because you haven't corrected the, the postural static posture dysfunction first. Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right, so let's do this. Because I know 
we all have to run here and have stuff to do. But before we wrap it up, a couple things I want to just kind of dig into um, at the end are number. First of all, there's lots of cool stuff. You know, obviously we've talked about the importance of posture, um, but there's lots of cool stuff, quote unquote. I don't know if that's really the right word for, for this. Uh, out there on the market now, posture shirts and sensors you can put on your upper back that buzz every time you get forward. And there's things you can squeeze between your shoulder blades all day long. And all of this stuff, gadgets, uh, magic pills, po potions, you know, I would call them the body training aids like we have in golf training aids. These are the posture training aids. Quick, what are your thoughts? You like any of them, not like any of them, blah, blah, blah. Well, over in my drawer where I keep my keys, um, I have one that was given to me. Uh, I was teaching at the, what is it called? The, uh, the Tobias Harris event up in uh, New York City with Charles Smith. We were talking about why Tobias Harris believes in meditation and yoga and movement and sleep and red light and true dark glasses. And he believes that all of this hacking is going to prolong his career. So we held a health summit and I was in there speaking on a panel. One of the doctors for the ACSM, which she probably can't stand me right now, but I was being nice. She was like, I'm the one who is supporting the biofeedback device on your back. Now, the CEO was in the crowd of that of that device. And I said, look, I need to be nice about this because it's the device is correct. It's giving you biofeedback that you're bending forward and your head's forward. So it is absolutely a great training device. I wish it gave you the reason why you were needing that device in the first place which is, I'll show you one more picture before, I don't know how long we have, maybe three hours. No, I'm just kidding. It's long, but check this guy out. And I probably went for and thank God he had a tattoo because that's the same guy after 12 minutes of exercises at his hip. That's awesome. So don't tell me that the biofeedback device is a cause effect. It is a, an effect reader. Yeah, it's, an, not it's, a, it's, it's, it's a monitor. It's you know, it's a monitoring tool. Hey, you're doing this great, well. You're not doing this well, right? I mean, it's biofeedback, right? It's it's a great thing. Yeah, which has value as long as you understand its value. Yep. <laughs> Don't give it too much value. Perfect. The same thing as bend over and touch your toes. Oh, I can't do it. That's just an objective finding, like a hinge test. And then what we do is we we train your muscles so that you're your psoas muscle, and those people on here who are thinking glutes are this and this and this, well, you better, I, I look at the glute as the queen, and I'm not talking golf, because this is not a what I believe versus somebody else. The, I believe in static posture, the glute is just as important, but if the king, the psoas, is asleep, then the queen takes over. And I think and a I lot of people think their psoas is short and tight, and when the reality is it's just weak. It's just, it's, well, Vladimir Yanda, it's yeah. short tight week right so when vladimir was a client of ours with his post polio stuff that's why we got along so well because he went okay you're not about stretching the psoas that short tight week you're about repositioning the bones that wake up the muscle which is the plug to turn on the circuit breaker which then you can get your glute and your tva and your and all that stuff to kick in awesome all right last thing here so people listening are like, okay, this is all really cool. Maybe I'll buy my biofeedback tool. Obviously, posture is important. You know, my posture sucks. How do I, you know, like, give me one or two quick, simple, easy things that people can do right now, today to help. Obviously, being aware is part of it, but that they can do right now to start improving their posture immediately. At least the most common stuff. Number one, I need them to stand up from their computers and just try this. Uh, you got to be able to see my feet, so let's go. Your feet have to be, let's say most people's feet are like this. Jeez. And I wore red socks because it is, it is the holiday season. I like it. Okay. Santa. Number one, turn your feet 45 degrees, touching the toes together. So you're, gonna stand, you're standing up going pigeon-toed. I'm going to kind of talk through this in case people are just listening. So you're standing yep. up straight, you're pigeon-toed with your toes pointed together. Yeah. And yeah, they'll, they'll think that their heels are out far enough, but get them out there so it becomes a little bit uncomfortable. Okay. Now, tighten up your thigh muscles slowly. Slowly push them back like this, and you'll see what it does to my pelvis. If I'm a posterior tilt person like this or anywhere or sway back like this, they turn their toes together and tighten their quads. Now they've created this lumbar curve where they can't move forward anymore. Beautiful. So tighten this up. 
and then mix it with hands behind your head, traps down. Yeah, which means sho- take back. your shoulders out of your ears, people. Traps That's down right. means shoulders out of your ears. So your quads are tight, feet are pigeon-toed, elbows back, hands interlaced behind your head. So like you're getting that- arrested. So it's like your police come up to you, put your hands behind your head. You're going to interlace your fingers, put them by your head. We call it prisoner position. Yes, and unfortunately, I know that too well. I had a busy college life. No, I'm just kidding, guys. But just that one alone for, let's call it one or two minutes with their stomach finally relaxing a little bit, keeping the quads tight. They got to remind themselves, keep your quads tight, keep your toes down. And then here's what I need them to do. I challenge them to do this. Do that at the range before they do anything, before they stretch or anything. Forget stretching for a second. Pick up your pitching wedge, nine iron, eight iron, something you're not going to want to kill. And just slowly start hitting the balls like that. They're going to realize that that position, while their friend is teeing off hole number six, they're standing in the background, pigeon-toed, hands up like this for a minute, and all of a sudden they're hitting the best golf of their life, and they're going to think it's because they bought a new club. That's awesome. I mean, that's super simple advice. Anybody can do it. Doesn't cost you no equipment. No, just, just making a conscious effort to do the right stuff. So I, I really appreciate it, Brian. That's some great advice. I love all the things we talked to. I'm definitely going to have you back on because I know you and I, like you said, we could go on for three hours. Um, but our goal with this podcast is to let people try to consume it in a little bit more bite-sized pieces. So I definitely let me, ha- let me, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Let me give you one more thing just so they go. can have something because I want your listeners to get the most out of this. I'll create a link. That is uh, like egoski.com forward slash Ben Shear, you know, something like that. And then I'll, I'll put on there three or four exercises Love for it. them to have as a gift from you. And they can just do that. It'll have my contact information and it'll let them know where we have clinics, all that kind of stuff. But at least they're getting exercises. They're free of charge. Take them. It's a gift in 2019, 20, and they can actually get some exercises done that literally I'm telling you, Trevino, Palmer, player, Nicholas, They've all done the same exercises I'm throwing at you. So if you want to play like them, then do these four. All right, maybe not play like them, but still, you you at least have a better play. Bet. Better. <laughs> awesome. Well, I I really appreciate that. I'm sure the people listening appreciate. It. So it's going to be a goscu.com slash Ben Shear um, that they're going to put up there. Some really cool exercises. I cannot thank you enough for coming on. I can't thank you enough for providing all that awesome information for the listeners. So again, I'm sure you and I will talk uh, before next time, but I'll definitely have you on again. Thanks, B. All right, buddy. All right, take it easy. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please give us a follow on social and check out our website at www.bencheergolf.com for all of our programs and products. Also, be on the lookout for our next episode as we continue to discuss the best of everything golf.